Hello and welcome. My name is Elizabeth Shackelford and I am a senior fellow of US Foreign Policy at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Thanks to everyone joining us on YouTube today for this program to discuss the impact of Western military assistance in the Sahel in the face of growing insurgencies and democratic decline and what it might look like in the years to come. Before we get started by means of a disclaimer, please note that the council is an independent and nonpartisan organization and it takes no institutional policy positions. Views expressed by participants on this program are their own. If you have a question you'd like to ask the panel, we're taking audience questions in around 30 minutes via ccga.live. Simply enter ccga.live into your browser, follow the on-screen prompts, and you'll be able to submit uh, your question or vote for your favorite question listed there. With that said, I'd like to welcome our panel of experts into this conversation. Camissa Kamara is presently senior visiting expert for the Sahel at the US Institute of Peace. She formerly served as Mali's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Digital Economy and Planning, and as Chief of Staff to the President of Mali. Ode Darnal is an Associate Director at the New American Initiative, uh, Engagement Initiative in the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security at the Atlantic Council, focusing on the analysis of armed conflicts and the humanitarian development peace nexus. Colonel Armel Daru is the Deputy Director of Defense Strategy with the Ministry of the Armed Forces of France whose operational experience includes tours in Bosnia and Kosovo, Afghanistan, and the Central African Republic. And finally, we are also joined by Olivier Remy Bell, Special Advisor for the French Presidency of the EU at the French Ministry for the Armed Forces. Welcome to all of you, and thank you so much for joining us here today. So I'm going to jump right into questions. Um, and I'm gonna start with Camissa, just so that uh, folks know, Camissa unfortunately will have to leave in about 25 minutes. So uh, we're gonna try and get as much of her expertise uh, as we can while she's here. And I wanna start with you, Camissa, by giving us the view uh, from kind of governments and citizens on the ground in the region, just to kind of lay the framework for us. Uh, from that perspective, how can Western countries be better and more effective partners? And what's your view of, of how this intervention has been going in recent years? Thank you so much uh, for, for having me as part of this discussion. I think it's an important one to have, especially in the current context uh, of the Sahel region where uh, you have a growing anti-Western uh, sentiment, um, which citizens have expressed in, in many ways. I think it's important also to um, remember that this military assistance that has been provided to the region has evolved over time. Um, back in uh, 2012 and 2013, when the Malian government uh, collapsed and the, the, the military assistance uh, from, well, I shouldn't call it military assistance, but rather military intervention of um, uh, the African Union, uh, African troops, as well as French troops uh, came into Northern Mali that was very well welcomed by the population and um, the uh, transitional government of the time. After uh, Ibrahim Boubacar Keita was elected in 2013, it was also thanks to the way the international community had um, helped to lay the ground for elections to actually take place. Now, looking at, you know, almost 10 years later, how that military assistance is perceived, I would say that because it has lingered over time, because um, maybe there have been uh, ways that this uh, intervention or military assistance hasn't communicated, um, the population has growingly uh, um, showed that uh, it was against this military intervention because of the human rights violations that um, some of the, uh, especially the French um, uh, Bar Operation Barkhane has um, uh, been accused of in, in the region. So I think what, what we need to really keep in mind is that this uh, intervention has evolved over time. It was very much needed uh, 10 years ago. Now uh, part governments of the region are looking at um, other partners and, and I would like my, my co-panelists talk about uh, maybe a Russian intervention in the region, um, but we have to also keep in mind that uh, the way uh, social media has also um, participated in communicated, communicating, sorry, um, about the successes of the failures of the military interventions in the region has contributing, um, has contributed, I'm sorry, has contributed quite a lot to the way these military uh, interventions have been perceived in the region. Well, thank you. And we're going to turn more to the, the French perspective shortly, but I, I want to bring in a little bit more on the uh, American side. So, Oda, I'm going to turn to you because you've got 
um, a, a lot of perspective on the experience of you know, the U.S. counterterrorism efforts in the region. And even the Pentagon has admitted that those two have been coming up against, um, uh, you know, they've largely failed. So can you talk a little bit about the U.S. approach in the region, why it's been ineffective and how it might be more effective as well in uh, addressing long-term stability issues? Sure, and thank you, Lizzie, for inviting me to this event. Um, so just to give a bit more background about uh, U.S. military assistance in the region. So contrary to the French, there is no uh, American operation uh, in the Sahel, uh, but there is you know, logistic support that is being provided to the French. And let's say that uh, U.S. Uh, assistance has really been focused on security sector assistance. So a lot of capacity building with training and equip uh, programs. So uh, talking about training, you know, about uh, human rights, gender, civil, uh, civilian military uh, relations, uh, flint exercises where you have uh, security forces coming from uh, different countries uh, in the region to participate in counterterrorism exercises, equipment donations, um, and all of that focusing on the military forces, but also the police, the civilian police. Um, but to understand this better, uh, we need to go back to um, the primary analysis that has been framed uh, within the global war on terror. Um, because of that framework, basically, um, the security sector assistance has really, I mean, the, the, there has been a militarization of what is a political issue. I think there is a broad understanding and agreement that we are seeing what is a crisis of governance, yet because of the global war on terror framework, um, there's really been a shift from the Department of State's to the Department of Defense. Uh, and as I said, the militarization and securitization of what is a political issue. And what I think is really um, programs that are missing on the root causes uh, of violence. So um, uh, capacity building and security sector assistance has been focusing on short-term military gains over longer term needs for reforms of the institutions and really the security sector governance. So um, this really is a tension there between you know, interests of um, Western actors and the needs and interests of local ones. And not only we've seen that, um, well, security sector assistance has not worked. Um, I mean, we see it with the coup, with um, the violence against civilians that Camisa has um, uh, talked about, but also the evidence, the, the, the large body of evidence that security forces that have been trained by Americans um, went on and committed um, um, abuses of force against civilians. So not only it, it doesn't work in terms of preventing organized armed groups to expand and thrive, but it is also counterproductive because um, uh, it's basically, you know, I, I like to use this metaphor of uh, strengthening the walls without working on the foundation of the house. Um, so really focusing on units and programs and capacity building of security forces rather than looking at um, the weaknesses of the uh, military institutions themselves. So this is a bit the analysis I, I do of, um, uh, um, of uh, US uh, engagement, at least in the security sector as, uh, assistance field uh, um, in the Sahel. Of course, um, there are a lot can be done. As I said, you know, um, uh, putting back the, the, the question into the hands of the Department of State, uh, providing more funding, working on the oversight as well, which is, uh, which is uh, not adequate and efficient. Uh, and we can go back to these questions later on. Um, and really working on the institutions um, and putting back the entire question within the political, economic, social issues. Thank you, Owen. And, and I'd like to turn now to Armel to provide more perspective uh, from the, the French approach. And we've heard from Owen a little bit about some specific ideas of how the American approach might be improved. But of course, the, the French forces are really the, the face of this, um, of this effort in much of the region. So can you talk a little bit about what the greatest obstacles have been to success for the French intervention? And, um, and why they're facing some of these uh, challenges to effectiveness. Uh, to my mind, I see three kind of societal and conceptual uh, obstacles to the success. First, we live in Western societies led by quick wins or quick results. We demand our investments pay off immediately because we are focused on the short term. We are incredibly impatient people and this is a huge flow because we lack of strategic passions. Um, to illustrate this, uh, this first obstacle, I just would like to mention an African motto. In Central African Republic, many people 
uh, Tony, you European have watch. As Africans, we have the time. And this highlights how we consider or um, highlight the, the perception we have on the short or uh, long term. Second, in contemporary conflicts with stipulated rules of engagement, the limited aspect of war, the imperative of proportionality of methods and uh, instruments of attack together with the non-respect for the principle of youth in bello by non-state actors, such conflicts do not appear to lend themselves to final resolution. A situation um, of asymmetrical engagement doesn't render non-state actors de facto the weakest party. These irregular actors create in fact a range of asymmetries of which they take advantage directly because they are free of consideration and constraints relating to the principle of youth in bello, and hence act according to their own rules. Thus, while non-state actors face, face an asymmetry in terms of equipment, one might equally assert that, uh, asymmetry, that asymmetries confront mandated troops too, relating to their approach to armed conflict and the psychology of, com of combat, precisely owing to their respect for and adherence to the rule of international law and norms. These diverse compendium of asymmetries represent the difficulties at the very heart of stabilization operation. And third, it seems to me that we made a conceptual mistake in defining the recent conflicts as global war and terror, because terrorism is a course of action, not an enemy. Uh, we can't fight a way of combat, but we have to define and to name the adversary or the enemy, something to which Western countries are perhaps reluctant for reasons of political correctness. I don't know. At the end of the day, because of this mistake, I believe that our public opinions become wary and feel that there is no end to this protracted conflict. However, if we had defined a right end state that wasn't war on terrorism, people would have understood and kept a global picture and would objectively assess the real improvements on the field where nothing is, is linear. Oh no, sorry, is linear. The downward curve of violence has sometimes limited violence eruptions, but the overall trend is rarely downwards. Okay, well, I definitely want to explore that, uh, that um, uh, several of those concepts, one being, you know, is the, the trajectory downward violence? But um, let's uh, turn though now to Olivier, because I'd like to, you know, I think that we're aligned. There's a lot of agreement in what some of the challenges have been. Uh, but what are some of the ways that France and your European partners have changed the approach to try and address some of these challenges and what further change needs to be done in the future? It's a, it's a good question because we're right in the middle of the reconfiguration, obviously, of European presence in the Sahel. So let me first zoom out a little bit before looking forward. Um, if we zoom out a little bit over the, the medium run, uh, we see there's actually some degree of continuity uh, with several waypoints, the Po summit in 2020, the Njamena summit in 2021, and then the announcements by the French president uh, last June about the, the shift in French presence um, uh, have, a, have are part of the same, uh, in a way, adaptation to the, the situation. Uh, there's the idea of needing a, a greater uh, civilian involvement, the, the so-called civilian surge uh, that led to the Alliance Sahel and the Coalition for the Sahel. Um, there's uh, also the idea of having a broader international presence. And we have seen European, uh, Europeans be present in ever greater numbers uh, than they had in the, in the previous years. And that was quite unprecedented. And then there's the idea, underlying idea of uh, increasing uh, ownership, um, local ownership, um, in a way that was, what was partly behind Takuba, the special operations uh, forces, um, the special operation task force that gathered European special forces to accompany Malian uh, troops in combat. Uh, the idea being that you couldn't just do uh, basic training through the EU training mission and then uh, turn a blind eye to what happened afterwards, but you needed continuity, combat partnership. Um, but also at the political level, and you saw less uh, in the past year, ECOWAS was really uh, put in the, in the driving seat as much as possible. Um, that and also, uh, thirdly, uh, 
greater focus on a more regional approach, looking especially at what happens to the coastal states, uh, um, Ivory Coast, uh, Togo, and so on. Uh, so, and essentially that was really the dynamic beforehand, uh, even as we went in 2021. Um, the shift obviously uh, now is still underway. Uh, we're taking some time to uh, consult all of the partners to fine tune the details and that's actually healthy. Uh, it's a time of consultation with the other European and American partners because um, one of the experiences uh, for France is in a, way of, in a way of leading a coalition, needing to take into account all those viewpoints from the other partners, but also, and that's important to consult the African partners to see what their needs are uh what they and that actually takes time to to really uh ascertain beyond just equipment or training what is actually really needed um and in the background of that there's a reflection it's more than a reflection there's a process at the eu level to adapt the way the eu uh does with stabilization operations uh one of the track is reforming the eu training missions and the model of the eu training mission having them evolve towards something that is let, moving away from the training of units and towards structural operations uh, with uh, advisors uh, in the in the joint staffs, that, that sort of thing, um, and that actually has been uh, enshrined in the strategic compass, which is sort of the EU roadmap for European defense that defense ministers adopted yesterday, and that the heads of states and government will approve at the European Council this Friday. So this is really right in the middle of the process. All right. Well, there's um, a lot to consider there, and I want to turn to you, Camissa. Um, because, you know, and recognizing that you're going to have to leave a little early, I'm going to give you a big question, big, a couple of big questions to, to address. Uh, one is, you know, do you think that, um, what, do you think that Western intervention, how it's been over the past number of years, has played a role in the rash of coups that have occurred in the, in the region? Um, and do you see a positive affirmative uh, role for Western military assistance to play moving forward. You've heard what Olivier said about the changing kind of shifting approach to more of a partnership model. Do you see space for that to be a really, uh, you know, a potentially positive move? Um, and how can they really address the um, kind of bad reputation that has developed over recent years? Big questions indeed. Um, so looking at the speed of coups that West Africa has experienced um, recently, uh, since 2020, actually starting with the August 2020 coup in Mali, I would think that um, military coups are deeply domestic uh, political, well, shocks to political processes um, internally. And I am not so sure that uh, military intervention have had a role to play um, in the way the coups have, um, uh, 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 have, or the way that these countries have experienced the coups, or even the fact that these coups have, have happened. Um, for having worked for a government which experienced a coup and um, the, the regime uh, uh, collapsed in 2020, I don't, I don't believe that uh, military intervention has had um, anything to do uh, with that. On the contrary, I would say that uh, international actors have played a role in trying to avert the coup and making sure that um, uh, the stakeholders to the different crises uh, speak to one another and try to find a common ground to avoid um, the coups from happening. Unfortunately, in the Sahel region, more than anywhere else, I believe that um, political processes are very much dependent on the security situation in a country. And whenever a president or a, a leader of any kind is perceived as not being able to tackle the security situation, then he puts himself in a situation where uh, the population will want for him to go. Um, there are definitely other governance issues that countries are dealing at the, the local level that military intervention cannot take care of. And uh, looking at the positive aspects of military intervention, I do not believe that, um, uh, you know, whether there, there have been human rights violations or not, military intervention have, um, has been very slow at coming at uh, bringing the terrorist threat to, to an end. But we could only imagine uh, what this terrorist threat would have evolved to be if military intervention hasn't been, or if the, these military actors, the international military actors had not been in the region. So I think this is um, a positive point. 
But I would also say for having worked in a government that uh, was deeply fragilized by the security situation in the region, that a lot remains to be done when it comes to communicating to the people about how those military op operations are being conducted, uh, the successes that those military operations um, have had, but also the constraints under which those military operations are, are being conducted. This is very, very important. And people will look for information, and I keep coming back to this issue of social media because I think that they tend to uh, destroy the, the small successes that some of those intervention have had. Whether they're small or not, they're nonetheless important and they need to be communicated well and in a language in which the population will um, recognize itself. Well, I must admit, I'm relieved to hear that the trajectory is, you know, also from the perspective on, of, of someone um, who's previously been in government there, that the perspective is positive, if, if very slow. Um, so that brings us to more of a question, uh, which I'll turn to you, Ode, about this, which is, so if it's not a matter of causing these challenges, it is a matter of not being able to, you know, rapidly address them. And we've heard from Armel as well about the challenge of, um, you know, wanting these short-term wins. But how can Western partners help these governments in the region address those underlying grievances, those governance challenges, those uh, longstanding insecurities that um, that just continue despite um, pretty significant levels of military intervention in the past? Oh, thanks, Lizzie. And I mean, Camisa's, um, Camisa's points were, were quite interesting. Um, before diving into the question you just asked, maybe I, I would like to push to push back a little uh, and just question some, some of um, the, the assumption that we may have on one side or another. Um, there is, I mean, there has been studies about um, the likelihood of pool and links to trainings as opposed to, let's say, funding directly to governments uh, when it comes to um, uh, supporting uh, the security and military sector. Um, if we go back to the past two years or even before the past decades, uh, many of the coup, I mean, there, I mean, there is a number of coup leaders that had been trained by U.S. security forces. Now, it is not to say that uh, military assistance directly um, favors coup, but at least I think that because of the body of evidence and the literature as well, I mean, it deserves perhaps more scrutiny um, when assessing um, the efficiency uh, and um, the adequateness of um, the security sector programs. Uh, at least if not uh, favoring the coup, well, given that these programs um, um, are supposed to uh, uh, promote uh, human rights and the rule of law and um, you know, even civilian um, um, oversight of military institutions, the fact that we see that multiple coup leaders were indeed trained, and not just in Africa, if we go back um, to the assassination of um, President Moise in Haiti, um, several of the um, alleged assass uh, assassins had received training uh, back in Latin America by the United States. So I feel like there, there still needs some, some things to to unpack there and really study uh, deeply to, if we really need, if we really, really want to have a broad picture of, of what works and what doesn't. Otherwise, I feel like, you know, the, the argument that says, yeah, if there was no operation, what would happen? I mean, I agree, perhaps that the situation would be much worse, but I feel like to some extent that argument also favors kind of a status quo where we do not have incentives to change uh, what we've been doing for the past decades and what clearly is not working or at least is not enough. Um, so to come back to your question, Lizzie, of you know, um, what could be done better, uh, and I think we've discussed that um, previously, um, I think that there is a need to, to move back to, to really the political question. I mean, we're talking about governance, not just security governance, but also governance uh, broadly. Uh, we're talking about the root causes of violence. Um, the lack of uh, basic services, grievances among local uh, communities and populations. Um, but there are champions, I, I call them champions of peace. Um, there are local experts, there are champions of peace at the very grassroots level with, you know, youth leaders, women leaders, religious leaders, uh, NGOs, and also, you know, towards more national, the national uh, level within the government, governments themselves. And I feel like sometimes, you know, when we, we talk about the frustrations and the perceptions, what comes back, and at least that's what came up uh, in my last trip to Mali, 
there was this growing question, um, and there is this recurring question of, well, you have a lot of stabilization efforts by external actors, but we're talking about stabilization by whom, for whom, and how. Uh, and, and often what came back was um, um, civil society organizations, for instance, was this feeling that there was kind of that, you know, that paternalistic um, uh, um, approach to the question, to the different questions of security and political uh, uh, governance. And I think that uh, uh, there needs to be, uh, while there is a rhetoric among the, the various actors that there needs that civilian focus and that civilian led approach and, you know, localized programs and all of that, I feel like there is still a disconnect between those discourses and the actual implementation of them. Um, even in terms of security sector governance, I watched you know, a hearing, a Senate hearing um, a, a couple of weeks ago where um, the Assistant Secretary of State for uh, of political and Mil military affairs of the Department of State really emphasized the need for um, a more security sector governance rather than just mere uh, equip, uh, uh, training, equip, uh, training, equip, and capacity building of military sectors. But even, even with that in mind, um, I'm really keen to see how this translates. And so perhaps, uh, Olivia can tell, you know, I mean, we'll see what, what comes, what comes, um, what, what comes down of the, of the European efforts in that sense. But I feel like, you know, again, moving back to the, to the civilian led initiatives, um, civilian control over security, security forces is very, is, is critical. Um, but also not just looking at the security sector itself, but really combining this with the political, economic and social issues. I mean, this should just be, you know, we're talking about holistic approaches all the time. Again, this has a lot of, um, uh, there are a lot of challenges to translate that into, into practice. But I do think that there, there is something there that should be um, dug, dug into a bit more. Right, you've raised some really good points and I want to take a couple of those and direct them to our, um, our friends here from the French government who can share their reflections on this. But Armel, I'd first like to, to address the question of human rights, which Otis brought up and you also raised in terms of the asymmetric challenge of the, the, of the fighting happening in the region and the fact that you know, one side, the side being trained by the West is constrained by, you know, um, by laws of war and human rights imperatives. Um, but at the same time, you know, we've also heard and we've seen um, evidence of you know, human rights abuses when they do occur by troops that are trained by the West tend to really, um, really harm public opinion of those initiatives. So can you talk a little bit about you know, what the human rights implications are of military assistance and how can we have greater accountability for Western trained local forces while still enabling them to, you know, to do the important security work they're there to do. Human rights and respect for rule of law are part of our ethics, are part of our professional ethics. And we don't act without this um, safeguards. Uh, when, we, when we have the mission or when we have the task to teach um, partners, we pay huge attention in teaching them uh, in human rights and in the respect for the rule of law. Nevertheless, as I said when I, um, uh, earlier, uh, it requires a long-term uh, teaching because uh, what, is, what is normal for us, because uh, these values are the basement or the foundations of our societies are not compulsorily shared by other cultures. And this is why we have to pay uh, attention and we have to be patient in teaching these, these, uh, these values. You say that uh, some Western troops made some abuses. That's true, but it is definitely not the norm, not the rule. There are only exceptions, but uh, through social media and through the, the media, um, we, we, we have to be shocked and we have to, to, to condemn these abuses, but they are not the norm. We can't make a generality of such behaviors and we are mainly, and the huge majority of soldiers um, are deeply focused on applying and on respecting uh, human rights first 
in uh, the rule of law. If we intervene in, uh, when we intervene mainly in foreign countries, if we don't respect the local uh, culture and human rights, we will never win uh, heart and minds. It's, it's, it's very simple. It's not, a, it's not a big scoop, but if we apply these values, if we share these values, uh, it will be less, I don't say easy or not easier, it will be less difficult to carry out all the tasks we have to, to do in order to rebuild, to rebuild these, uh, these failing countries. Okay, thank you. Now I'm gonna turn, we're, in just a few moments, we're gonna turn to audience questions. So please uh, go to ccga.live to uh, share the questions you have for our panelists or to vote on uh, the question that you would most like to hear addressed. Um, Olivier, I'd like to turn to you now and Oud had mentioned a couple of the issues, you know, how the need to address these underlying issues of governance and, you know, institutions and um, civil society. And, you know, I know from the American perspective, having worked in places where we have big uh, military footprints, it's been very hard. We've talked a lot about the need to address these underlying issues but most of the resources are still going to, you know, the security imperatives. So, you know, looking ahead, how can, uh, you know, the European training efforts factor that in and ensure that those governance issues get enough of uh, the attention that they need in order to ensure that the military, um, the military um, work in the region is going to you know, be complementary? It, it, it is the, the thousand dollar question. Uh... Uh, and indeed, it has been, uh, as you, we have discussed that a lot. Um, first, let me say uh, that it is also logical that there is a, a hefty amount of focus on, on military assistance because that is the, the first uh, layer of the cake. You cannot conduct development projects uh, if there is still a terrorist threat abroad if your uh, development project is at risk of being attacked uh, or if your development uh, workers or even if local the local institutions that you are creating are at risk of being kidnapped by the armed forces um, so there there is complementarity at that level that being said obviously uh, we have always thought that we the the, real, the heart of the matter laid at the political and the governance level um, there have been criticism about the over militarization of our approach, but no one in the ministry ever thought there was a finite supply of terrorists. You could kill them all and then pull the forces back home, um, which is why, I mean, the, the N'Djamena summit in 2021 was already about the civilian surge uh, and creating the coalition for the Sahel to, to do that, uh, but also mobilizing the EU's integrated approach, development assistance, military assistance together. Um, We've seen uh, that indeed we might need to get uh, better at it. It's it's a a learning process also for the European Union, uh, which had never really confronted something to such a scale uh, so close to home. Um, and at the moment, the, the shift that is underway, as I mentioned, is really that we're it's about rethinking that uh, presence, the footprint, um, the fight against terrorism continues, obviously. Um, but the idea is to move toward greater uh, local ownership and to um, and to do that also in a, in a concerted way with other European partners. I think that's really also something we, we learned in the past years is we want to work together with a coalition uh, rather than in a, in, a two bi in a way that is too bilateral with uh, regional countries. Um, and that in a sense, uh, ownership and multilateralization are really the the, the underlying trends at the moment of the shift that is underway. All right, and now turning to, uh, thank you, turning to questions from the audience, we've got quite a few. Uh, the first one that I, um, that's that gotten the most, uh, the most votes I'm going to move to, which is a fairly straightforward question. What is happening with regards to fighting ISIS and other terrorist organizations in the region? This is a big question. Um, Odell, I'll start with you there though. Can you uh, just give some some thoughts on what's the current status of uh, you know ISIS and the, the terrorist presence in the region. So I wouldn't. I, I would rather have uh, our French counterparts answer the question because, to be fair, I really focused on uh, U.S. assistance uh, uh, in the in the region rather than on the groups themselves, in particular in the Sahel. Um, however, what I what I know uh, in terms of um, American assistance is that with the with the coup, there has been a suspension 
of uh, U.S. military assistance towards Mali. However, it is not clear. It is a partial uh, partial suspension. It is not clear whether what is the current status of assistance there uh, in terms of uh, training and equipment, uh, training and equipping uh, Malian security forces. Um, uh, but there is still, uh, and there there is still other uh, other assistance that be, that is being deployed, uh, at least on the more you know development side. When we're talking about the holistic approach there, um, so that's that's kind of uh, I mean there, it's it's not quite clear what's happening uh, in terms of um, the Americans' approach there, and I do not know where it is going to go, especially with the drawdown of um, um, the French forces, and obviously this question raises many others in terms of, you know, how um, the Malian forces, the G5 style force, uh, will step up, uh, how the European uh, force, uh, Takuba, will 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 uh, continue their operations there. So there's quite a bit of, um, there's quite, you know, it's it's quite of a, a blur and a, um, uh, uh, I mean, a very, I say, big moment uh, here for the Sahel. Um, but at the same time, I do believe that it should also be a wake-up call um, for um, the, the various Western partners. And um, just earlier you asked, you know, how, how this should translate. Uh, in terms of the American perspective, I do believe that it needs to start with Congress. Um, there needs a, a push at Congress really to, uh, again, as I said earlier, um, move, um, um, beyond, uh, um, um, uh, move funding from the Department of Defense to, to the Department of State so that this really, you know, uh, becomes a, a Go, goes back to the to the foreign policy field and not just the military one. I think that's the very first step there. Um, uh, th there is also um, uh, pushes for better oversight, uh, reforming the, I mean, if it is reforming the Lehi law or um, uh, perhaps uh, uh, working on all, some other uh, 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 laws to, to have more comprehensive and efficient uh, oversight there. Um, but just, uh, I just wanted to also qu uh, quickly come back to something that, uh, Ahmed said earlier about you know the, the values that need to be shared and I think this is an important uh, in particular when when talking about how to how to better the system um, you know sometimes that perhaps uh, on the West perspective there's sometimes this this um, th this trap of wanting to impose a model um, and I think that to kind of like overcome this um, this trap uh, uh, avoid avoid this pitfall uh, rather um, the focus on the values and the principles, you know, we're talking about the rule of law, human rights, uh, oversight, accountability, civilian participation and all of that. Um, that, you know, focusing on the principles and uh, finding with the local partners and letting the local partners decide what model actually fits the system and their and their uh, specificities is really the, the 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 way to go however I, I wouldn't agree that the values are not necessarily shared I, I believe that you know people wherever they are um, do want justice that wants their their rights to be uh, preserved and um, and uh, uh, emboldened and supported um, but it is true that when we go back to the, the institutions themselves, there these principles might not necessarily be um, emboldened, um, so, and that's where that's where the, the focus should be on. Thank you. So we've only got a few minutes left. I want to put a couple of questions together for uh, both Armel and Olivier. Um, first, starting with any, do you have any responses from the French perspective of what the fight against ISIS looks like right now? Uh, but also, we've gotten several questions about um, the, the role that both China and Russia are playing in the region. How are the tensions between the West, China, and Russia playing out? And I'll add in there, you know, what is the um, impact of the current uh, war in Ukraine having on that, those relationships? Regarding the, the fight against ISIS and ACME, it is very important to mention that France is not leaving Sahel, the Sahel. We are just withdrawing from Mali, but we stay in the region. And we are still um, following the, our military operations, thanks to the support provided by the US. Because without the US, we, we couldn't be so uh, if, uh, efficient or effective on the field. It is very important to, to mention that. And um, regarding China and Russia, definitely they have some influence. Uh, China is uh, providing a lot of money 
and uh, Russia tries to influence um, lo uh, local leaders like Malian authorities in order to uh, thwart the Western interests in Africa, in order to destabilize the continent, just in order to create um, a threat or a threat or uh, a crisis on our area. Because if we put uh, the Russian action in Africa with the conflict in Ukraine, we don't have to be focused only on the eastern part of Ukraine. We have to, to observe all the area we have and the, the, the closest area in which we are uh, committed. Uh, if we believe, I just say, if we believe Vladimir Putin, Russia is not present in the Sahel. According to Moscow, uh, Wagner Group is a private company that is not linked with the Russian government and that do not and that does not represent the interests of Russia. Nonetheless, the risk uh, we are facing now for a few years, for a few years is the comeback of Russia through an hybrid, an hybrid policy. And um, Ode mentioned, no, or Camisa mentioned uh, at the beginning of this call, the importance of the social media. And through this uh, social media, uh, Russia developed a, a very strong subversion to, um, to discredit Western countries, particularly France. And this is, and this is why we are concerned on this uh, specific uh, activity. And uh, but, because there is a but, uh, Moscow is not able to provide financial resources to Wagner. And Wagner uh, is uh, characterized by its predatory behavior and as well by its violence and brutality towards the population. And uh, I don't hope that the population face um, abuses, but I hope that very that, that quickly the population will see the reality of Wagner and its actions on the field. That is only focused on the protection of the uh, of very few people that we could uh, call as warlords, or uh, I wouldn't say criminals, but uh, authorities. And uh, I hope the reality will come back uh, quite quickly in order to open eyes of the people. Um, in the three minutes we have left, uh, three very rapid fire points. Uh, the first, because the question of Russia is uh, an important one, that the, the reconfiguration, the shift in French presence isn't the result of Wagner uh, arriving in Mali. Uh, it's the result of the political choices made by the, the Malian regime the, the, that came out of the coup, uh, that made working with local... Uh, we, we talked about how this isn't just a military operation, but the, the root of it is political, the solution is political. If you do not have a political partner, then there is no options for you. And that really uh, was the reason that underpinned the shift of French presence. Wagner is a symptom of it, but Wagner isn't the, the, what caused the reconfiguration. I think it's important to, to stress that. Uh, and two quick points to underline um, elements that have been raised by, by Armel. It's really interesting because the Russia and China's presence in the South from a European security perspective really emphasize that we cannot have a disconnect uh, between collective defense and the East and what happens in the South. Fragilities in the South are also going to be uh, exploited by uh, those with malign intentions uh, and, and really within the, the strategic compass, which was adopted yesterday, that was one of the big debates, the ties between the East and the South. And third quick points, uh, I mean, Wagner isn't good news if you look at what happened in Central Africa. We have a test case of what a country uh, and with Wagner presence looks like, uh, and that should be uh, really a wake up call also uh, to borrow all the expression. Okay, well, just before we wrap up, Ode, I'll give you just the, the last word here if you'd like to respond on, um, on and, and maybe just share your thoughts on if there is a hope for a more uh, positive future with uh, positive security assistance from the West moving forward. Sure, thank you. So, I mean, obviously, I think that, you know, Russia and China have, let's say, um, the chance not to have to have been associated with the West failure. You know, there is no colonial uh, background. And so perhaps that's, you know, the perception 
uh, that what's what comes often, you know, that paternalist, imperialist um, approach by the West is likely not associated to um, Russians and, and the Chinese. Um, but, um, and this is something that we discussed um, um, earlier, you know, about the perceptions. Uh, I think it would be interesting, and, and we, we do not have time now, but it would be interesting to, to look at the perceptions of Malians, depending on, you know, who they are, where they are located. Um, and if now uh, Russia is seen as, you know, the new actor, um, well, first, you know, they also have interests, just as the U.S., just as the European Union, just as the France, and um, per positive perceptions today might not necessarily uh, remain like so tomorrow, you know. Uh, I mean, we have reports of um, abuses of uh, uh, viol uh, violations of human rights uh, by Wagner. Um, so, so it would be interesting to see how that develops in the future. And in terms of, the, of, of China, well, China has definitely been invest investing massively um, across the continent in West Africa and the Sahel region. And I think, um, you know, this also shows that, well, African countries do have leadership, they have agency, um, they decide what partner they, pre they, they favor. Uh, depending on what issues that is, uh, is at stake. Um, and, and, you know, while sometimes I feel like there might be this, um, this assumption or uh, their, their cooperation will be taken for granted sometimes, I feel like this, uh, these new dynamics that we see with other powers, not just Russia and, and China, but we also have India and Turkey, um, is, should also be um, uh, something that should be um, kept on the radar in terms of engagement and, and not just in terms of assistance, because I feel like sometimes, at least in terms of American relations with the continent, it is framed a lot um, um, within you know, the aid and, ass and assistance uh, framework, but it should really be partnerships, you know, economic partnerships. There are a lot of, there are, there are um, um, opportunities in so many sectors, economic, health, tech, uh, banking, um, so, so I would say that these these are these are um, uh, opportunities for for better you know better partnerships that not only serve Western um, interests but also African interests and you know really looking at them as partners and just not recipients of assistance. All right. Well, thank you to everyone who tuned in live. And as a reminder, this conversation will be available for playback on the council's social channels and the website shortly. For more insights on critical global issues and dialogue about what's happening in the world and why it matters to people in Chicago, the United States, and around the globe, please take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And in closing, please join me in thanking our panel of experts for being on this program today. Uh, it was a real pleasure speaking with all of you, and it was a very dynamic discussion. So thank you. <laughs>